Hello, I'm Lisa burkhart Worley, along with Lane jordan Burday and Renee Rollins, and welcome to Pop Talk, the show where you never know what topics might pop up. Suicide is one of the leading causes of death in the United States. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, over 49,000 people died from suicide in the United States in 2022. That's a 2.6% increase over the previous year. Today on Pop Talk, coming to you from the National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Nashville, Tennessee, we're going to be speaking with a woman who's trying to help those who are suicidal. Lane has the introduction. Thank you, Lisa. Our guest today is Kristen Christie. She is the creator of the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. She is also a sought-after international speaker, author, and resilience expert. Through her lived experience with a stroke at age 15, loss of her first husband to suicide, mm. Then her son's attempts and the disappearance of her oldest son, she has dedicated her life to empowering individuals along with teams and organizations so that they can thrive in the face of adversity. We just want to warmly welcome you, Kristen. Let's start with your stroke at the tender age of 15. How did that affect your life? Thank you. I love being here with you all. Thanks for the question. 15 years old, I was a world-class athlete, uh, played tennis and golf, and had my plan for life, right? <laughs> already already planned out, and I had a major detour just before my 16th birthday. Um, experienced a massive stroke in October of 1983, um, and had to go through brain surgery, had occupational and physical therapy and speech therapy my kids complain my speech therapist was way too good (laughs) but um, it was when we were driving down the Audubon we were living in Germany at the time my dad was Air Force and I told my parents I wanted to jump out of the car because I had lost my identity lane my identity was misplaced it was on what i did not who i was as a person as an and as a daughter of the king um and and that's when my parents realized i needed uh, mental health therapy as well took me a year and a half to learn to walk again i write with my left hand now Uh, and i've had to find new avenues for my talents And that was difficult at that age, but I think it's difficult at any age to find that sense of purpose. I think as human beings, we want to all feel protected, respected, and connected. And that threw a wrench into that. Wow. That had to be such an incredible, uh, mind-blowing experience for you at 15. And we know God's ways are not our ways. And he has obviously called you to help those who, in many ways, are trying to give up. However, he used what you went through with your own family to place this call on your life. I cannot imagine losing your husband to suicide. Tell us what the circumstances were, and were there some signs that we can look for in our own family members? Shame and guilt lived in my household for 10 years after Don's suicide. Uh, He was Air Force. He had been deployed to Iraq. One of the things that we didn't realize until afterwards was he was in charge of the human remains. Making sure that those flag-draped coffins received a dignified and respectful transport home from Iraq to their loved ones back in the States. And we think that that is what changed him. He came back different. Uh, We hear it a lot, especially in combat, that a, a military member goes overseas, but they don't fully come back. And we saw that in, in Don. He was typically an introvert, uh, but he was more so at the time. And these are signs that I didn't really notice until afterwards. 16 years ago when he died, April of 2008, 
we really didn't talk about suicide. It wasn't something that was in the forefront of my mind, but our marriage imploded. Our family was devastated by his choice. Uh, but I noticed afterwards his fingernails were bitten down to the nubs. Being more reserved, someone at his funeral came up to me and said, Kristen, I noticed he took the family picture off of his desk. At, the po at that time, they didn't think about it, but these are signs. So I, in 16 years, I have learned the tools that I did not have back then. One of the tools that I needed to learn was I needed to forgive myself for what I did while try trying to survive. Right? I did the best that I could with the tools that I had. And so I have learned more resilient skills to be proactive rather than reactive. And I, my friends call me an emotional support human <laughs> because I want to walk alongside people that are going through the tests in life. Uh, the athlete Vernon Law has a, a saying that I love, life is a tough teacher. We get the test first and then we learn the lesson. And it is so important that when we learn the lessons, then we help tutor others as they're going through the lessons because we can't always be there for them during the test. Um, so I've learned a lot looking back at, at some of the signs. You know, he would say things like he was a, he felt like he was a burden to the family or a burden to the community or not working very well. And that was where I should have come alongside and said, you are not a burden to the family because now we know the burden left behind that both of our boys, 12 and 14 at the time, attempted suicide. Research indicates that if someone has a loved one who dies by suicide, they are um, more likely to attempt and so my kids were in that statistic uh, and then my oldest son's been missing for over eight and a half years still missing and i as a woman of faith i pray that he's on the side of heaven if he's not i know where he is but i just want to know for sure I can't even imagine going through that as a mother, you know, for as a wife, first of all, and as a mother. First of all, I just want to go back to your husband. And I think coming out of military situations like that, there should be mandatory counseling. And I don't know if that's offered, uh, but we had a family member who came out of Iraq, and he wasn't the same. And he gave up his family, uh, and he did something he shouldn't have done. And, and so I, I know that he, he had really experienced some kind of PTSD when he was there. I was just talking here at the NRB with some of the men who were actually uh, on the team that picks up the, they were picking up all the dead bodies in, in Israel. And I said, are, the first question I asked is, are you getting any counseling? He goes, well, that's what we need funds for. We need, we need counselors because we've had to, you know, we was dead body after dead. In fact, we, he, they said, we're picking up the Hamas terrorists, you know. We're picking up their bodies as well. So that is an important thing. But as a mother, as a mother, going through this with your sons, you know, with your son's suicide and the, the one that is missing, how do you maybe, how do you hold everything together? How do you hold your family together? Where does your strength come from? So first and foremost, my strength is on a firm foundation of faith that I am a daughter of the King. Amen. And that has gotten us through so much. The other factor is our community. We are not made to do life alone. And we surrounded ourselves with friends who really came alongside um, to, to pick us up on this emotional battlefield called life. They held the armor of hope and courage for us. For example, I was in such a depressive mood that there were times that I wouldn't take my kids to school. I couldn't get out of bed. And my friends would come over and they wouldn't take the boys to school. They would get me out of bed to make me take the boys to school. So they weren't enabling by any means, but they helped me, they let me borrow the courage and the hope that I needed. Um, and I think being a community member is so important. It's part of that connection. 
that we need as human beings um, to, to be there. And our friend showed up in, we call it postvention, whether for any tragedy. Postvention, because we know things are going to happen in life. When, when you have a friend that you want to stand by and you want to help them through this tragedy, um, show up for them in any way you can, whether it's text messages, emails, cards. You know, we don't get much in the mail anymore, right? But when you can send something in the mail to them. I love it when <laughs> I get mail. <laughs> Isn't it great? Um, but, but also... You don't have to say anything. I think this is important. That night, 16 years ago, I remember every single person who was in my kitchen and living room supporting us after we were notified. I don't remember many of the conversations, but I remember two. Both friends from church. One came up and she said, Kristen, he's in a better place. And in the rawness of that moment... I said, why isn't the better place at the kitchen table with his family? Now, 20 minutes later, another friend from church came over, gave me a hug, and she said, Kristen, I have no words for you, but I'm here, and gave me a hug. And she didn't have to say anything, and it's okay. You don't have to say anything to fix it. Show up and do something. Be intentional with them. The first 30 to 45 days, people are very focused on the what we were going through. But our 10 out of 10 on the pain scale stays that 10 out of 10 longer than 30 to 45 days. So we had friends that continually, they were intentional and they would check in on us. Um, we had a friend that every Friday night, they said, you and the boys come over to the house. We will have plates out at our dining room table. Whether you come or not, you don't have to call ahead of time, but you are always welcome and know that you have a place Friday night that you can come spend time with your community. So I have a question. After all of this had happened to you, and I love it, you decided to take action and created the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. And I love that you call it a lifeline. When did you get this idea, and what were some of the very first steps? Because it's got to be hard to start something. I think hard is a very good word. (laughs) That is for sure. So Don died in 2008. In 2010, I'm still wallowing in my failure as a spouse and failure as a mother. And I was, um, I just thought we have 911 for a medical emergency. Why don't we have a three-digit number for the suicide prevention lifeline? So in 2005, three years before Don died, the lifeline was created. Um, And it was a 10-digit number, and it still is, 800-273-TALK, T-A-L-K. But I thought, can we break down barriers? When you're in darkness or when someone you care about is in a in that veil of darkness it's hard to look up this 10 digit number and so i was started socializing the idea of a three digit number for the suicide lifeline um in, and and so i just kept talking about it and just as i would talk about it people say oh that's a great idea and then they would connect me with a decision maker. So it took 12 years. So when you say it, <laughs> 12, 12 years, 12 years. So from 2010 to 2022, in 2019, the FTC took it on and said, yes, we're going to do this. Uh, in 2020, it was signed by an executive order by President Trump that 988 would be the suicide prevention lifeline. In October of 2021, we all received a text message from our cell carrier saying, even for a local number, you need to dial the area code. And some people were a little upset about that until they found out why, because 988 had been as an area code and they needed to change it 
so you have to dial 10 digits on your cell phone even if it's a local number uh, and July 16th of 2022 it went nationwide so we still have the 800 number and we have 988 and if you think of those two as two website addresses that point to the same website they all point to the crisis lifeline where you have amazingly professional volunteers to help get you through that crisis or help you Renee if you call and you have a friend that needs their services they help walk you through what you need to do as a person of influence in that person's life dial one if you're a veteran or military and you reach someone who has the cultural understanding and dial two for Spanish speakers Wow, what a story. That is so exciting. And what tenacity you had. And the Holy Spirit was behind it the whole way, wasn't he? Wow. So tell us how it works, Kristen. Can someone just dial 988 and and get help? And So talk about the counseling and what goes on in those conversations. So when someone dials 988, they are... Uh, connected to a professional who has gone through the training. Sometimes they're licensed professionals. Um, sometimes they they are volunteers who have gone through the training. And it's done state by state. So the state of Tennessee, where we are for NRB, uh, when you dial 988, you're going to reach someone in the state of Tennessee. Um, If your area code, like mine is, I live in Colorado Springs, my area code is 719. If I dial from the state of Tennessee, it's going to go to Colorado. Um, So they're looking at how, how is that working? It's still a relatively new process with 988. Now, again, they've been around since 2005, but they're going to ask, you know, what's going on? How can we help? What are some resources in your area um, that that are available to you? I think that's why it's so important to have someone with you if you are in a dark place to call. Because I know when I've been depressed, it's hard for me to remember the f- conversations that I've had with people, right? It's nice to have someone to take notes for you. Uh, and to walk you through that process. So it's a stopgap. It is not a long-term, you know, they they aren't going to keep calling you to give you counseling services. It's a stopgap to put you in contact with counseling services. And they have um, direct line to 911 in your area if intervention needs to happen by, um, by law enforcement. One of the things that I wanted to ask you about, because I'm involved with um, Billy Graham Ministries, and we do online chatting, and we have specific suicide protocol. Are one of the first things they say to them, or are you, are you in a safe place, or do you feel safe now? What are some of those first questions that they address them with? So, so I socialize the 988 idea but I did not create the suicide hotline. It was already there. Um, And luckily I haven't had the opportunity or the need to call for myself. Um, But you're right, just as the Billy Graham Ministries has a protocol, they have questions that they go through. It's triage, if you will, um, to, to make sure, you know, one, is the person who's calling the one who needs the immediate help or are they the friend? And t- because that's going to be different. They're going to let you know as a friend what you can do to be, to have that empathy, right? To sit in the darkness with them. Um, that is is so important to to do. But it's, it's a resource out there. There are a lot of other resources, but 988 is breaking down the barriers, I think, to get help. And I will say that in the first year, um, phone calls went up 35%. Uh, and text message, you can actually text to 988 saying, I need help. You can, so 
my son, who's 28 now, my youngest son, uh, would much rather text than call and talk to a person, right? So they have that opportunity. And then you can go online and chat with them online as well. Text messaging has gone up a thousand percent in the first year. I would say a lot of the younger generation who might be suicidal would text before they would probably call 988. So how did you set up this volunteer network is what I'm wondering and with all the, you know, this different states and different places that the, these call centers are. I mean, did you have to do all that yourself or did that was already in place? It was already in place. My, um, the teamwork and I, I'm a co-creator, uh, my my work was to break down the barrier to get them help sooner by making a three-digit lifeline. Again, this has been around since 2005, um, and they've got it down to a science. It's amazing. It, but as just by the numbers I mentioned, text messaging went up a thousand percent. That's breaking down the barrier. And I think getting rid of the stigma that it's okay, you know, it's not okay to ask for help. You can do it on your own. And that's, we aren't made to do life alone. I'm going to say it again and again and again and again. We aren't made to do life alone. And it's okay to ask for help to get through. Yeah, I I, I remembered that a lot in um, church because we always would encourage people to do small groups and to do small group Bible study, women's Bible studies, because a lot of times you think that your problems are the worst in the world. And I'll tell you what sat, what, what, what uh, takes care of that is when you get into a small group and you start hearing about other people's problems, you go, you know, maybe my world is not that bad and maybe my problems are not that bad. Sometimes I think you need to get into it, not only for encouragement, but you got to you got to take your problems in perspective. You, you've got to understand where they, they stack up against some of the other problems in the world but I think being in community that is extremely important. Yeah I'm so glad you brought that up Lisa because you, you don't do life alone. So I have two questions. The first one is who's paying the counselors? Can you answer that? Like okay so I, I just I, I just she's nodding no she doesn't know but because um, I was immediately thinking of how expensive it must be but that's, thankfully, that's a different section. And then is there any follow-up after the call? In other words, do you guys connect the suicidal caller with some resources in their own area to get some support, especially immediately, and to help turn their mindset around? You hit the nail on the head. It's turn that mindset around that is so important and getting that phone call, that initial phone call in. Um, I know that some have had follow-up. I think they try to follow up with them. Um, you know, in our mental health industry, we are such short-staffed. Uh, it's, it's incredible. It's sad. But the research also indicates that of 10 people who seek mental health services, eight of them need someone to listen to them. They don't need a licensed professional. They need some, we need to teach listening skills. <laughs> listening is yes. such a powerful skill. Again, you don't have to say anything to make it better, right? They need to get it off their chest and someone to just have an understanding um, with them is so important. So. I've had people ask me after I, I speak, I always leave some time afterwards to, to speak with people individually because it is a tough subject. Well, it's not a tough subject for me. It's an untrained subject for a lot of people to talk about suicide. But I want to spend time with them and, and they want to know what they can do to help people, um, which is so important we come together. It sure is. You know, according to the CDC, suicide rates increased 37 percent between 2000 and 2018. So people are getting more hopeless <laughs> and that percentage does not reflect attempted suicides. 
What do you think are some of the, the issues that people are facing that lead them to the point of desperation? So sometimes we talk about, you know, it's death by despair. Suicide can be death by despair. Um, research indicates the top three reasons that people indicate financial, relational, and legal issues. Um, of those, I think, you know, relational, it's all about communication. It's about an understanding with each other. Um, and they're just so important. If you have financial difficulties, there are people willing to help, but you've got to reach out. It takes courage to reach out and ask for that. But you, but you talked about helplessness and hopelessness. And I talk about hope. So as a military spouse, I speak in acronyms. And I'm writing a book now on acronyms. HOPE stands for hold on, pain eases. It doesn't end. The E does not stand for end. You all have experienced a 10 out of 10 on the pain scale, I'm sure. And that it ebbs and flows. It eases. But HOPE also stands for help one person every day. Get outside of your own circumstances and help someone else. Quickly, we're about out of time, but uh, Kristen's been great talking to you, and, and I think this has helped so many people. But you have a big event coming up called the National Resilience Day, March 4th, 2024. And that's coming up really quick. Can you explain what that event is and what you're calling people to do? Yeah, March 4th, uh, National Resilience Day, because we march forth and conquer our insecurities and our disappointments and our adversities. And um, it's just a day to talk about resources that have helped you overcome. Mm, I love it. Thank you, Kristen, for sharing about this, my goodness, very important subject. I am sure most of our listeners have been touched by suicide in some way. Maybe it was a friend who took their own life or a family member, but it is extremely devastating because it happens so suddenly. And then we often beat ourselves up because we believe we did not do enough to save the loved one. You are doing a great work with the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. And for you listeners, if you want to connect with Kristen, you can go through her publicist, which is Eden Gordon. You can reach Eden by mail at hello at Eden Gordon Media. And Eden is E D E N G O R D E onmedia.com We'd also love for you to reach out to us at Pearls of Promise Ministries. You can email us at info at pearlsofpromiseministries.com Like us on Facebook at Pearls of Promise Ministry. Follow us on Twitter at Pop Talk or at Instagram Pop underscore Ministries. So that is Pop Talk for today. We're just ordinary girls. Who God turned into pearls. Y'all have a great week.